Hello and welcome to your online lecture for um, head injuries and acute cervical spine pathologies. We just finished up the last module, which is really just addressing kind of the non-catastrophic cervical spine injuries. And so the purpose of the next few lectures will really be on how do we treat patients who have catastrophic, maybe even life ending uh, injuries. I want to make sure that you're prepared to handle that, especially if you're one of those students who plans to work in the high school setting or the collegiate setting, um, right? With a DeMar Hamlin collapse on the field, are we able to actually truly care for that patient the way that they need to? So the pathologies that we're going to talk about in the this lecture will really be more life-threatening um, and will require emergent care and probably a quick quicker response on your behalf as a healthcare practitioner. So if I haven't said this, just keep this in mind that the potential for catastrophic head or cervical spine injuries, at least in the field of athletic training, can be life ending. It can um, have lifelong consequences, uh, such as the development of like CTE in football athletes. But the great thing about this, right, here's my cup half full, is that the overall rate of catastrophic or acute head injuries, at least in the field of athletic training, is relatively rare, right? I, mean, I think the exception might actually just be um, football. But I want to say this, it's not in the scope of this particular class, but it becomes extremely important to have an emergency action plan in place, which guides you and directs you when you actually have an acute traumatic injury occurring in the clinical um, segment. So let's move to anatomy. And this should look like a review, but hey, we're in a program where learning over time is extremely important and where review, um, I think, uh, comes into play here. So let's think about the skull from this perspective, with the exception of like the foramen magnum, right? Remember, that's that little circle on the base of the skull that allows for the um, spinal cord and the brain stem to move through, right? So with the exception of that hole in the, in the skull, one of the great things about the skull is it is surrounded by several different cranial bones. And we talked about this earlier on in the class, but just for review on the front part of that, we have the frontal bone um, on the, I will say most anterior, maybe even anterior lateral portion, you have the parietal bone. Most posterior portion is going to be covered by the occipital bone. And then laterally, we have the temporal bones on both the right and the left sides. And there were other bones that we talked about that kind of come together to help create kind of this skull um, or this bony architecture that is really um, committed to protecting the brain. And so that's going to be that sphenoid bone, um, the ethmoid bone here, even portions of the zygomatic um, arch. And then you can see down here that that mastoid process is going to kind of hook down and also support um, or protect the brain as well. But let's look at this. Let's look at the skull a little bit differently. Um, as I started to prepare for this lecture, I got really excited to think about kind of physics a little bit, right? Um, we all wonder why do we have this prerequisite of physics? And I think this is one of the reasons that we actually do this. Um, we think about the skull's design. It really is designed to maximally protect the brain, right? First and foremost, like if you've ever done a craniotomy, then you know that the skull's density in terms of the bones that encompass, encompass it reduces the amount of physical uh, forces that will be transmitted to the actual brain. So first and foremost, we just have these very dense bones surrounding that brain and protecting it and absorbing most of the shock so that the forces that are that occur to the actual skull itself typically don't get transmitted down to the brain, right? And so that's great. It reduces the forces that are going to be transmitted inwardly. That's a great thing. But the other thing that we can think about is the skull is pretty much a rounded shape, right? Um, and so that in and of itself has protective qualities that I never really actually thought about. But think about it this way. When an object strikes kind of a rounded object, right? So when we strike a rounded object, what typically tends to happen? Well, one thing is it either gets deflected relatively quickly, right? Um, and so one thing we can think about is like when we toss a, a basketball um, towards a wall, what happens? It doesn't impact the wall and stay, what does it do? It kind of rebounds back. So we can think about it that way. The other way that we can think about it, okay, maybe we drop a brick on a basketball. What's the first thing that it does? Is it kind of falls off of the basketball. So that rounded nature of the skull itself 
is really a beautiful thing because what it really does is it allows force to be dissipated right across the school more evenly um, or in fact uh, it doesn't it doesn't absorb most of of the shock because of its rounded nature so that rounded portion that rounded component of the skull is extremely important because it is going to be protective in in nature right um, lastly we have this thing called i don't know skin um, or our scalp right which then uh, adds another kind of external layer and so that that skin or that scalp um, that covers the skull increases the cranium's ability to protect the brain by absorbing a lot of the forces or kind of redirecting the forces so we have different protective mechanisms we have bones that are very thick in their density um, absorbing some of the shock right we have the rounded nature of the skull which is going to dissipate the force and then last but definitely not least we have our hair and our scalp which are also going to absor absorb a lot of the force right um, when we think about the skin that scalp uh, one of the things that it does is it kind of increases the skull's strength um, and so what we see is like uh, essentially when we have that protective layer of, of skin surrounding the actual skull that it um, breaks the force um, about 40 pounds per square inch. So we can see it's extremely important to have an intact scalp because it actually does help dissipate the force. So now that we've talked about bony anatomy and we can appreciate the role of, of the cranial bones um, and not only the cranial bones, but the shape of the skull and then also um, the scalp and how they really work to reduce injury, you can see why they're just very rare and how it's going to take a lot of force, an increased amount of force to actually cause some type of acute traumatic brain injury, right? Um, so in terms of anatomy, um, one thing that we have to think about as we kind of look at a, a look from a larger lens is we have the central nervous system and then we have the peripheral nervous system, right? That central nervous system is only going to contain two anatomical structure, the structures. The first one is going to be the brain. The other one is going to be the spinal cord, right? And then we have the peripheral nervous system, which is going to contain all of our cranial nerves, um, all of our peripheral nerves, which will emanate off of the actual spine, and uh, then any other ganglia that, that um, kind of arise outside of, for lack of better words, outside of the actual spinal cord itself. But where I really want to spend time is in the peripheral nervous system, right? Um, so the peripheral nervous system is a part of the nervous system that lives outside of the brain and the spinal cord, right? Its major role, like when we think about the cranial nerves and the peripheral nerves, uh, the 31 peripheral nerves um, that we've kind of talked about throughout the, the, the first few weeks of the course, it is majorly important because it 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 sends information from different parts of the body um, back to the brain where it gets processed, right? But then it also carries commands from the from our brain to various parts of the body, and we can think of that as like muscle contraction, for example, right? Um, or muscle spasms, for example, right? Um, those are just different types of examples. So overall, the peripheral nervous system is just as important as the central nervous system. Even though um, it doesn't get as much credit, the peripheral nervous system plays a major role in, in the sensations that we that get interpreted by the brain that we ultimately will experience, plays a major role in the type of motor movement that might occur throughout the, throughout the body, right? Um, it plays a major role in our autonomic uh, responses as well. So some of those might be like the way that our organs actually operate. Um, so we can see that even though the central nervous system or the organs in the central nervous system get a lot of credit, Really, the two, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, are integrated units, and, and one really can't um, thrive or be as efficient without, without the other. So let's move forward to this image here. We've talked a lot about the bony anatomy and the shape of the skull, but then there are other things that work to actually protect the brain. And so what you're looking at here um, kind of are the meninges of the brain. So those are going to be the, the, the structures that really work hard to provide um, the internal support, right? If we could say the bones, for example, the scalp, those are all going to be external ways to dissipate or reduce the forces coming to the brain. And on this side, what we have are the internal structures. So if that force that's been applied to the skull is allowed to move through the scalp to the skull and through the thick, dense layer of bony anatomy, then what we are left with then are the, what we call are the meninges of the brain. And these are the tissue-like structures that are most responsible internally for 
for protecting the brain. The most outer layer is known as the dura mater or the tough mater as, um, a, or the tough mother or hard mother as you might know it. So we can imagine we have the skull and then the next layer just deep to the actual bone is going to be the, the dura mater. So it's the outer layer, it's closest to your skull. It's going to make the most contact with the skull. Again, if you did that craniotomy, you would have seen some of that dura mater stuck to the most deep structure of, of the bony um, component of the brain, right? And so when we think about the dura mater, um, the, the things that you have to really truly think about is it consists of two connective layers. The first one is periosteal. Uh, and then the second is is the meningeal layer, which is going to house a lot of the, the meninges responsible for kind of supplying the brain. But in addition to that, one of the interesting things to note with the dura mater, if there's compromise, is it actually contains a, a drainage system. Um, and that drainage system is responsible for kind of allowing deoxygenated blood to leave the brain and then also allowing um, cerebral sp spinal fluid to enter the brain. And remember that cerebral spinal fluid is extremely important because it's part of what moisturizes the, the, the brain itself. In addition to that, that dura mater is important also because it's going to receive a lot of its blood supply from the uh, middle meningeal artery and, and the vein. And then last but not least, our trigeminal nerve, which we'll talk about, will run through this layer as well. So your, your dura mater, it's important because it's the first line of defense after the forces are able to kind of be transmitted through the external structure. You can see there's these two layers. It's responsible for removing the oxygenated blood, right? Or recirculating that and then allowing cerebral spinal fluid to enter. The middle layer is known as the arachnoid layer. Um, as the name implies, arachnoid, it kind of means spider. So when you look at this particular layer, you'll see that it has kind of small branches that kind of all come together, um, but it looks almost spider-like in its appearance. Um, and that's because you have like connective tissue projections that are coming out of the arachnoid layer. Um, it lies directly below your, your dura mater. Um, and again, it also contains a lot of cerebral spinal fluid, which is good for obviously um, moisture and nutrition, but then also to help kind of cushion, right? So there's more fluid, more force is being directed. Hopefully they get dissipated in the actual fluid. And then the most bottom layer or the layer that is closest to the brain is the pia mater. Um, this is the most inner, the innermost layer of the brain. Um, it's a thin layer that's really held tightly to the brain, almost like saran wrap or shrink wrap, right? The interesting thing about the pia mater is that's where many of the blood vessels will pass through in the brain. Um, and so in, in this particular layer, we have blood vessels passing through the pia mater to actually supply the brain tissue with, with blood. So if there's injury or compromise to the pia mater, then you're concerned with compromised blood flow to the actual brain itself. So those are the kind of three layers. Um, this is, uh, the pia mater is probably the most delicate of the three. It's probably the most thin. So when we think about the word uh, uh, pia, um, it typically means tender. Um, and so it's the most um, delicate or most, can be the most compromised in an actual head injury. Now I've talked a lot about cerebral spinal fluid, right? Um, we know what it is and we've talked a little bit about it. But as we think about cerebral spinal fluid, which lives in some of these um, meningeal layers that we've, we've talked about, it becomes important to just understand that cerebral spinal fluid is going to circulate around the brain and um, around the spinal cord, right? And so, and it is it is not only responsible for providing nutrition or moisturization, but in addition to that, it's protective in nature, right? Think of a waterbed. Um, if I lay on a waterbed, it's going to displace the fluid and absorb some of the shock. So your cerebral spinal fluid will do uh, something very similar to that. Now, as we progress, we have these kind of lobes of the brain. And I think it's important to really talk through them a little bit because just knowing that you have a frontal lobe and a temporal lobe um, and an occipital lobe and a parietal lobe doesn't really quite cut it at this level, right? And so as we dive deeper in this class, we have to understand like, what are these lobes responsible for? In other words, like if there is injury to these lobes, then what is my patient actually going to present like or present with in terms of the actual signs and symptoms, right? So we have these four lobes, the frontal lobe, which you can see here is in the most anterior aspect of the brain. 
We have the parietal lobe, uh, which is going to be more posterior or central posterior. And then we have the most posterior lobe, which is going to be the occipital lobe. And then on the right and left side, we have the temporal lobe as well. And each of these lobes are important to understand what they actually um, what they actually do so that when there's injury, we can understand where the deficits are actually going to lie. And so that, that frontal lobe is the most anterior lobe, right? Um, we can see that there. It is extremely important, <clears throat> number one, because it houses a lot of the dopamine receptors. Um, and so dopamine is most often going to be associated with like reward, attention, short-term memory tasks, planning, and, and motivation, right? So when we say frontal association, a lot of times when we're thinking about that frontal lobe, it has a lot to do with uh, patient memory, for example. So short-term memory in particular. So if a patient may not be able to remember something that just happened, then you're thinking maybe there's a frontal lobe deficit, right? Um, it does play a role in uh, speech um, and uh, language development. So any injury to kind of that lateral anterior side, um, and you're worried about whether or not a speech has, has been compromised. Next on the list, we have the parietal lobe. So we can see that here. Um, it's really close to the somato somatosensory cortex, which if we think about what somatosensory implies, we can see that a lot of the things that we do in life um, um, are really parietal lobe driven. In other words, that parietal lobe, lobe is really going to integrate sensory information. Um, and that's going to include sensory information about um, spatial sense and navigation or proprioception, as we would call them. Um, a sensitivity to touch or mechanoreception, for example. In addition to that, there are major sensory inputs that come from this particular area, and that's going to be like touch, temperature, and pain. In addition to that, it's also responsible for um, language acquisition as well. So we can see that parietal lobe makes up a, a large chunk of what we do as uh, individuals. Okay, in the most posterior aspect of this, we have the occipital lobe. Um, the occipital lobe is known as the kind of visual processing center. Um, so when we think about that, the biggest thing that we're thinking about is the primary visual uh, cortex or Broadman's area, for example. But ultimately, what do you think the occipital lobe actually is responsible for? Someone me. Great. If you said uh, visual task, visual spatial processing, color differentiation, maybe even motion perception, right? Anything that has to do with the visual system, that occipital lobe is going to be mostly responsible for. And then we have the temporal lobe. Um, the temporal lobe is located on the most lateral aspect of, of the, it is the most lateral of the four lobes that we are discussing today, I should say it that way. Um, the temporal lobe um, of the brain that we probably um, are most concerned with is the kind of the hippocampus, which is responsible for like memories and learning new things. But then in addition to that, that temporal lobe, we talked about auditory association, really plays a major role in kind of language comprehension, emotion, emotion association. Um, in addition to that, um, hearing it will be a big Thing that it may be compromised in the temporal lobe. And we can understand that, right? That te temporal lobe is very close to the kind of ear canal. Um, so it would make sense that hearing um, would be associated with temporal lobe damage. So we have those four lobes, but then in addition to that, um, if we move over here, we have um, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hind, hindbrain. Um, in the forebrain, we have the cerebrum, not to be confused with the cerebellum. So we have the cerebrum, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. And the cerebrum is really makes up the largest kind of portion of the, of the brain. It's going to be composed of two hemispheres, right? The left and the right hemisphere. I wish we could see. I could go here. So your left and your right hemisphere and that left and right hemisphere is kind of separated by what we call is a longitudinal uh, fissure. And these kind of um, hemispheres are divided into obviously the lobes of the, the brain, right? But the cerebrum is huge because it's mainly responsible for motor function. It certainly helps with um, sensory information such as, uh, or sensory information perception such as touch, pain, or pressure. In addition to that, um, it also controls some of the special senses such as vision, hearing, smell, and taste, cognition, and memory. So we can see that any damage to the actual cerebrum, and we're really, really concerned, right? Because 
the biggest thing that we're thinking about, oh, is, well, is my motor function going to be compromised after an injury to the actual cerebrum itself? Now, we have the, th the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Um, the thalamus itself is uh, responsible for kind of routing afferent information to appropriate cerebral areas. So taking information from the peripheral and making sure it, it, it is processed in the right cerebral areas. In addition to that, it's responsible for kind of regulating consciousness, right? And sleep and alertness. Your hypothalamus on the opposite end of that, hypo meaning just below the thalamus, um, it maintains, it, it's important, it, it maintains the necessary water balance. Um, it also is responsible for um, regulating body temperature or regulating homeostasis. It also is a big contributor to regulating hunger, thirst, and sleep. Um, so oftentimes, if a patient continues to be dehydrated for weeks at a time, we'll refer them out to make sure there isn't a dysfunction in the actual hypothalamus itself. So we have the structures of the forebrain. Again, that cerebrum is majorly important because it controls, responsible for controlling motor function, right? And then next we have um, the structures in the, the mid, so that midbrain, as the name implies, it's kind of like... Um, uh, just a notch below the actual brain itself. The midbrain is a part of the actual central nervous system. It's going to be located right below, as you can see it here, the, below the cerebral, the cerebral cortex um, at the topmost portion of, of the brainstem. But it, you might say like, well, what's its, fo what's its function, Dr. Cosby? Um, its major function is uh, it's a channel um, for the spinal cord. Um, transmitting stimuli from the head and body to the direct brain. So it's like a direct um, conduit of uh, motor and sensory information coming from the spinal cord, um, directing that information from the spinal cord to the midbrain, to the actual brain itself to be processed, right? And either that's processed as movement or that's processed as some type of sensation that we, that we feel. One thing to think about with the midbrain um, is that if we had some type of damage to the actual midbrain itself, we wouldn't be able to respond to threats um, or even move. So like, you know, for example, if you put your hand on a stove, your midbrain is what lets you kind of jerk away from the stove. So if your midbrain was damaged, because it controls your motor movement and your reflexes, you wouldn't respond appropriately to that. You might actually keep your hand on the actual stove. Okay. I didn't talk about the, um, the pons or the medulla oblongata, but, uh, pons is kind of, it's like AKA, like it actually means a bridge. So the, the pons serves as kind of this direct link to the cerebellum. So cerebellum, you've got the midbrain, uh, then you're going directly to the brain. So if I could say what the pons major role is, it's really to serve, um, to serve, uh, as a link um, between the cerebellum and, and the brainstem and the spinal cord, basically connecting the upper and lower portions of the central, um, the central nervous system, right? In addition to that, injury to the pons um, could lead to changes in respiration as it is responsible for regulating uh, respiratory rates. If I talked about the medulla oblongata, please forgive me, um, but the medulla oblongata is it's simply just a relay station of information um, to and from the central nervous system. So I shouldn't uh, kind of skip over it, but it's a relay station. The pons and the medulla oblongata are relay stations really for um, information coming from the periphery uh, to the brain and then uh, information coming from the brain to the actual periphery itself. So we have the forebrain, we have the midbrain, we have the hindbrain, and then we have these frontal, these four lobes. Uh, any injury to any of these anatomical structures and we're concerned, right? And we should be able to at least understand, okay, the cerebrum, what's its major role? Motor functions, it's coordinating muscle contractions, right? And these are all gonna be important. So if I have a patient who struggles to coordinate muscle contractions or is struggling through motor functions, I'm thinking, okay, that's probably cerebrum, right? On the opposite end of that, if I have a patient who maybe is having a hard time falling asleep or maybe they're going in and out of levels of consciousness, maybe it's the thalamus that's compromised. So knowing each of these functions will become extremely important um, as you move forward and you uh, really wanna own brain anatomy. Okay, so there are different mechanisms of head injury 
Um, and so I'm just gonna put a few on the slide and let them kind of sit there. The biggest thing is um, each of these head injuries can lead to what we call is a traumatic brain injury. So knowing the mechanism of injury will be important because if you know the mechanism of injury, then you know where the bruising or the injury to the brain or to the lobe or to the parts of the brain can actually occur. And that will help you determine what's being impacted based on the signs and symptoms. So with cerebral contusions, um, most often the mechanism of injury is going to be a coup or a contra coup. So with a coup, that stationary skull head is still is hit by a moving object. Example would be a baseball bat being um, someone taking a baseball bat and hitting someone's head, right? The skull was stationary. The object that was moving was the actual bat itself. Most often trauma is going to be on the side that was actually struck. So anytime you have a stationary skull with a moving object, the trauma is always to that particular side or that particular area. On the opposite end of that, we have a contra coup, which means your head is moving and it strikes a stationary object. Example would be this image here, right? Where we have a moving head striking a hard wall. The hard wall is gonna win every time. Most often the trauma is on the opposite side of the brain. So example, if the frontal lobe hits or the frontal aspect of the brain hits, most often there's going to be damage to the occipital lobe, right? So we have to make sure that as we ask questions, we wanna figure out was the skull moving or did the skull actually, um, was the skull stationary? Because that will help us determine what lobe or which anatomical structure might actually be in, involved, right? So that's one of the first questions that we're gonna ask a patient coming into our clinic with some type of head pathology. Next would be repeated subconcussive uh, forces. So examples of repeated subconcussive forces are where the, the skull is taking repeated blows. So boxing would be an example of that, soccer with the, the heading of the ball. We can add to the slide maybe MMA, for example, where they're taking repeated subconcussive blows, right? In addition to that, you can have shear, shearing forces. So sudden acceleration and deceleration. Example of this would be like a car accident, right? Where you're speeding really quickly, you slow down, but your head may be moving um, uh, because it just hasn't had time to catch up in space. So those would all be examples or mechanisms of head injury that will help determine which lobe or anatomical structure is involved. So as we move towards assessing head injuries, first thing we have to do is rule out whether or not it's a life-threatening injury or a cervical spine injury, right? Because that's a call to 911. We're going to C-spine that patient and hopefully wait for EMS to arrive and they're going to get carted and cared for in the emergency room, right? Um, but what we know about life-threatening injuries or cervical spine injuries is most often the following will happen. They have a loss of consciousness. It doesn't matter how long any loss of consciousness is concerned. They may have disorientation or some type of amnesia. If they're able to stand, um, they may have some type of balance or motor coordination deficits, bleh, um, cognitive deficits, and then behavioral abnormalities. Most often with this behavioral abnormalities, we see an increase in aggression most often following some type of head injury or cervical spine injury. So here are those four lobes that I already talked through. What I want you all to do is um, think about what is it that the frontal lobe is most responsible for? What is it that the parietal lobe is most responsible for? Temporal lobe and occipital lobe. Um, appreciate that. And then appreciate, okay, if I have a coup or a contra coup injury, if it occurs to the frontal lobe or the occipital lobe, what would I kind of expect the patient to actually behave like, right? So now we're gonna dive into examination of specific head injuries. Um, the one we're gonna talk through is probably least acute, certainly is acute. It's the concussion or mild traumatic brain injury. In the field of athletic training, we've moved towards mild traumatic brain injury as opposed to concussion because coaches, when you say mild traumatic and brain injury, they're more apt to support athletic trainers in their attempt to remove a student athlete from sport. Um, but if we define what it is, it's injury to the head uh, resulting from some type of blood trauma or acceleration, deceleration forces um, that result in some form of broad spectrum of deficits within the patient. So the patient may not have all of these that I'm going to discuss, but either they have a physical or somatic sign. So headache, altered levels of consciousness, amnesia. They have a cognitive impairment. So they're confused, they're disoriented. They might be slower. They might feel like their head is in a fog. 
they um, have an inability to to sleep, right? Remember, we talked a lot about in the other side, the thalamus. Remember, it's responsible for um, consciousness and sleep and alertness, right? So more than likely what we're thinking about, maybe the thalamus is involved here. Maybe it's not. Um, they'll have some neurological or neurophysiological behavioral dysfunction, right? I talked about irritability already. Um, and then emotional symptoms. So they might um, suffer from depression, especially if they were repeated subconcussive blows over time. CTE would be an example of that. So as we define mild traumatic brain injury, um, there are different definitions that exist. The one that we kind of support as athletic trainers is this one right here, a trauma-induced alteration in mental status that may or may not involve a loss of consciousness. Now, this has been a change. You can see this is 2014. The language hasn't changed but prior to 2014, it only involved loss of, loss of consciousness. In other words, we didn't really think a patient had a mild traumatic brain injury if there was no loss of consciousness, right? And so the NATA um, with a group of mild traumatic brain injury scientists actually changed the wording to say it may or may not involve loss of consciousness. We all know if we go back to this slide that some of these signs and symptoms have nothing to do with altered consciousness, right? Emotional liability, change in irritability, confusion, disorientation. Those are also signs and symptoms that a patient has a head injury. So just keep in mind that's all encompassing. The next um, definition that's widely accepted, concussion is defined as a traumatically induced transient disturbance of brain function. That, isn't that scary? So at some point in time, we have this lapse in time where the brain isn't functioning like it's supposed to. Mainly our CNS, but certainly our PNS can also be involved in that. And it's going to involve a complex pathophysiologic process, which we're going to talk about in just a second. So in terms of statistics, because I think this is important, it's estimated that 300,000 sport-related TBIs, um, most likely concussions in the United States annually. So think about that. You're an athletic trainer getting ready to graduate from an athletic training program. 300,000 300, uh, mild traumatic brain injuries occur each year. So you're going to have a patient in your clinic who has a mild traumatic brain um, injury. We already know the stats are totally biased towards football with, and soccer because their soccer, their head is just not protected, right? Um, in high school and collegiate athletes, sports are second only. Um, so sport related concussions are second only to microvascular accidents um, as a leading cause of traumatic brain injury. So in other words, if it's not because of a bleed in the brain, then it's most often from some type of blow to the brain, right? That should scare you. The growing evidence exists on a, a, of, of a cumulative effect of MTBI. In other words, not only are there short-term consequences, but there are long-term neurocognitive impairments um, that have been de demonstrated after three concussions, which is why oftentimes I get the, like, how many concussions can a patient have in a season before they're disqualified? The threshold is three, because what we know is that if a patient has three concussions in a season, more than likely they will suffer from long-term neurocognitive impairments over their entire lifetime, right? Um, the recovery time in, is longer in high school athletes. So in other words, if a patient is in high school and has a mild traumatic brain injury, the research has been overwhelmingly um, suggestive that those that are younger take longer to recover from head injuries. And we'll talk about why it's a physiological effect, essentially. And then last but definitely not least, because younger athletes take more risk and usually don't follow our guidelines, right? Um, the risk of secondary impact syndrome is higher in younger athletes. In other words, they take a blow after a concussion and they um, collapse on the field. And we don't want to be the athletic trainer. So what I would say is err on the side of being more conservative than not with our patients. So as I mentioned, there are so many different signs and symptoms, right? We could go back a slide or two. So let's go back a slide or two, probably here, right? There are so many signs and symptoms that can be present in a patient following a, a mild traumatic brain injury. And I'm here to tell you that the um, cascade of signs and symptoms really is linked to, going back to this slide here, is really linked to, to the pathophysiology of a mild traumatic brain injury. So essentially what we kind of see over time is we have some sort of impact to the skull, right? We're gonna call that a biomechanical injury. There was some type of force that was applied to the skull what a, the, either the forces weren't dissipated or they were absorbed in, in the brain, right? Um, and so those forces kind of cause biochemical changes um, in the neurons within within the actual brain, right? 
Now, one thing to keep in mind is that many of those acute symptoms that are on that slide most often reflect a functional disruption. And so in this case, we're going to talk about neurotransmitters. We're going to be talking about maybe a lack um, uh, or a need, an increased need for glucose synthesization. Um, and so, but not a structural one. In other words, most often the brain itself doesn't become deformed, right? So we're not concerned about that. But what we are concerned about with is that because we have this functional disruption, we're storing it. And we'll talk about why rest is going to be so important because the brain is already using its energy resources to kind of repair the damage that has actually occurred. So as we move into the pathophysiology of an MTBI, um, I, there's this thing called the neurometabolic cascade, and it becomes extremely important to under kind of understanding this. So think about it this way immediately after a biomechanical injury to the brain. So immediately after a direct blow, um, essentially what we see is we have the release of, of neurotransmitters um, and we have the inability to kind of control ionic fluxes that will occur within the brain once it's injured, right? Um, so in acutely, in an effort to kind of restore neuronal membrane potential, um, guess which pump is gonna start to work over time? Anyone wanna tell me? Sweet, if you said the sodium potassium pump, you would be correct. That sodium potassium pump starts to work over time to restore um, the sodium and potassium that might be lost, right? But the problem with the sodium potassium pump is it's a selfish anatomical structure. It's gonna require increased amounts of ATP or energy, right? And as it requires that, it also triggers a dramatic jump, a dramatic jump in what is in, in glucose metabolism, right? So we can see where that energy crisis is starting to occur, right? That um, hyper, hyper metabolism occurs in this, the setting of, remember, we're going to have decreased cerebral blood flow because there's damage to the actual brain. Um, and then we also have a disparity between glucose supply and the demand of the sodium potassium pump. All of those things are going to trigger what we call is a cellular energy crisis, right? Now, this cellular energy crisis is what's responsible for some of those long, those symptoms that we see that are present. And it may be why patients with MTBI will present differently depending on the um, amount of glucose they have available or the amount of ATP they have available to help uh, supply the sodium potassium pump, right? Hopefully that makes sense. So, I need you all to think about it as you're thinking, as you're thinking thoughts that a head injury, yes, a biomechanical component causes it, a hit, a blow causes it. But once we have that, the force being absorbed by the brain, there's these neurometabolic cascades that are, are occurring to kind of support the sodium potassium pump to increase the amount of glucose that might be present. All of that done in a limited blood supply kind of environment, right? Until, of course, blood supply can be restored. And that might happen if we have a, um, a reduction in the swelling, for example, right? Um, so I wanted to say all of those things to say that as you start thinking about um, MTBIs, I really hope that not only do you treat the symptoms, but you also think about um, from a rest perspective, if the body truly is in an energy crisis, one of the ways to support that energy crisis is with rest, right? I know a lot of the research talks about activity after head injury, but in the first few days, one of the reasons you want the patient to rest so much is because you want um, you want to allow the body to naturally kind of um, restore all of the energy that it's it's been using to um, help with the in, the initial injury itself, right? Okay, so we could look at it from this perspective, right? We have this injury, we have un, this uncontrolled um, neurotransmitter release. And so then we uh, ultimately we have impaired neural communication. We have disruption of, of neuronal function. Um, and then we have altered blood flow regulation. So that decline in blood flow potentially um, increase in the sodium potassium pump, which is going to increase the need for ATP right? All of those things require energy of which an injured brain doesn't actually have. So as we dive deeper, one of the things that I talked about is knowing your lobes, right? And knowing if one of the lobes is compromised, knowing kind of what impairments your patients are going to have. So you can use this chart 
to kind of help you. Um, yes, this will be on the exam. But again, if you know the functions of each of the lobes, um, the cerebellum or the brainstem, then you should be perfectly fine um, knowing that if they have an injury to the frontal lobe, the signs and symptoms will be what. So as we talk about signs and symptoms of a mild traumatic brain injury, they're gonna, there's going to be a wide array of, array, array of neurocognitive psychomotor symptoms. And that really has to do with the neurometabolic cascade, right? Some, some patients may have a headache. They could complain of dizziness or lack of coordination or balance. Again, all about the lobe. If we look at this, most of these are going to be linked to the lobe that might actually be involved, right? No memory of events immediately before, which would be retrograde and or after the actual injury, irritability, brief periods of diminished consciousness and, and or unconsciousness, right? The most common symptom that most patients report following um, an injury to the actual skull is going to be a headache. And that makes sense, right? Like we're thinking about it from just a blow perspective. Uh, patients should have a headache, right? Especially if they took a blow forceful enough to cause an, a mild traumatic brain injury. So I'm going to stop here. And then we'll move into the exam and management of a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury. Thank you so much for listening.